So, so today I'm going to tell you about the things that I was sort of developing as a postdoc and that I will be then carrying forward in my research plans here. And the overarching theme is focusing on using band engineering to make more and more interesting artificial systems with superconducting circuits. And so my talk will consist of three parts. I'll start by introducing you to how we think of superconducting circuits as artificial condensed matter systems, either as lattices or as spin models, because I think this is more of an AMO crowd and this is less familiar. And then I will show sort of two examples where we use really the unique features of these superconducting circuit lattices to make band structures or photonic spectra that you wouldn't already have, namely a hyperbolic lattice and some conventional lattices with gap flat bands. And then at the very end, I will start to show you where we're planning to go with these, moving beyond just the basic photonic crystals to start incorporating qubits and get interactions. And I'll have a little bit of preliminary data from uh, a device aimed at engineering spin models. So this is a circuit QED effort. And so our main workhorse is going to be a microwave cavity. Our favorite and one of the most popular is the coplanar waveguide. So what this is is a two-dimensional analog of a coaxial cable. It has a central conductor and two ground planes on either side. And you can make a cavity in this just by cutting into the center pin like so. And so you get a voltage standing wave mode confined in this waveguide here. Um, in practice, people use the lambda over 2 mode at about 5 to 10 gigahertz. So these are actually fairly large structures by microfabrication standards. They're many millimeters long. So in practice, we actually make them with these meanders here to compactify the whole structure. And the presence of these meanders is actually key to a lot of the stuff I'll be telling you about later. Um, as a Hamiltonian level, this is a harmonic oscillator with charge and flux instead of position and momentum. But because it's just a harmonic oscillator, while we love it very, very much, it's not complicated enough to really make us an interesting either quantum computing system or a quantum simulation system. For that, we need something nonlinear, something anharmonic. Um, and the favorite at the moment is the transmont qubit. This is a circuit diagram of it. It's a capacitor in parallel with Josephson junctions. And so the Hamiltonian for this is n squared cosine phi. So instead of phi squared, we now have this cosine phi with higher order corrections. And that makes it nonlinear and anharmonic. The transmon regime of this particular circuit is when this coefficient ej is much, much larger than ec. And then we can really think of this as a particle in a cosinusoidal potential that has various bound states. And near the bottom here, this is almost but not quite parabolic. And so you get roughly harmonic oscillator-like behavior, except that the level spacing decreases as you go up to higher and higher energy levels. And so as long as you're careful not to drive too hard or too fast, you can isolate these lowest two levels and manipulate them as an artificial two-level system. And that is basically the transmon qubit. And then you can take one of these things and fabricate it inside the microwave resonator, and you get a capacitive coupling, which looks like dipole coupling of a traditional atom to a cavity. And you get this Jane's Cummings Hamiltonian here. So you have a harmonic oscillator description of the cavity spin for the qubit, and then this resonant dipole exchange of interaction is the dominant coupling term between them. Um, so what this looks like is if we look at the energy levels, initially the cavity has a harmonic spectrum. Transition energies are the same no matter how many photons are in there. But when you add coupling to the qubit degree of freedom, each of these harmonic levels splits into a doublet, and the splitting depends on the number of photons in the cavity at the time. And so this is our basic sort of coupled degrees of freedom that we're working with. And they can be regarded in two qualitatively different ways. So the first is a somewhat more traditionally quantum computing paradigm where you decide that the, the qubit or the spin is what you want to work with. And in that case, what you have here is a strong interaction with a single cavity mode excluding all other modes of the electromagnetic field. It gives you a nice bus with which to communicate with the qubit and to isolate it from other things. And what you get at the end of the day is a photon-mediated spin model whose form is really controlled by what kinds of cavity modes you have running around. Um, 
On the flip side, we can look at this the other way and decide that actually we were interested in the photon degrees of freedom. And then if you look at this, what you see is that your formerly harmonic photons now have an anharmonic spectrum where the transition energies depend on the number of photons that are in the system. And so you can think of this then as the qubit actually endowing the photons with an interaction. So these are the two ways that we're going to be thinking about the system. And in both cases, we care about what kind of photon modes are in the system. And so the focus of what will come next is looking at how do we make this more interesting by going beyond the single cavity, single mode picture to something with more photon modes in play. And what we're actually going to look at are photonic crystals. And so for us, this is what a photonic crystal looks like. This is a photograph of a device that was made a while ago in the Hauk lab at Princeton. So each one of these squiggly lines is now a coplanar waveguide resonator. And they meet at these teeny tiny little black dots, which if we zoom in, each of these is a three-way junction region where the center pin from three different cavities converges on one spot. And so when they come together here, there's a fairly large capacitance relatively between each of these which allows photons to hop between any of these three resonators. And so what we get is actually a tight binding model for microwave photons. Um, the on-site energy is given by the resonant frequency of the resonator, and the magnitude of the hopping matrix element is given by the capacitance in this region here. Um, it has one slight caveat here, which is that this hopping matrix element is negative. And so what that effectively means is that these band structures are upside down from what you would normally expect. So long wavelength modes are actually going to be at high energy, and short wavelength modes are going to be at low energy. But this is really just a global minus sign here. Um, but in addition to this global, this global minus sign, there are really two very unique features that these lattices have. And so the first is that these resonators are in a certain sense deformable. So what do I mean by that? This is a close-up of the CAD drawing for one of these resonators. And so it's a waveguide cavity, and light travels along it, hits the end, and bounces back. And so the frequency depends on how long it is. But the hopping matrix element is actually determined only by this little end region here, not by anything that's going on in the middle. And we made it out of a waveguide, and so that means we can sort of reconfigure what the waveguide is doing in the middle. And so you can take, for example, these three cavities, which look completely different, and they have very, very different end-to-end -end distances on the chip. But we can engineer them to have the same resonant frequency and the same hopping matrix elements. So at the level of the tight binding model, these three are, in fact, indistinguishable. And so what does that buy us? So I want to take a quick detour to a little cartoon. So here is a color map of the potential for a square lattice. And this is a color map for a disordered lattice where I've just randomly displaced all of these lattice sites. And so in the type binding approximation, what we want to do is replace these two continuous maps with a discrete graph. So we, put, we have one node per original lattice site. And on each node, we'll have a complex variable, which is the amplitude and the phase of the Vanier function. And then the edges, or these lines here, they represent non-zero hopping matrix elements. And so this is the way, the most intuitive way to associate a graph with the square lattice. If you take the disordered lattice, then you can do the same thing. But now the hopping matrix elements need to depend on distance indicated by the color here. So these two sites, which are close, have a large hopping matrix element. And these that are farther away have a small hopping matrix. But once we have gone down to this graph level here, it doesn't actually matter how you draw it. This is purely a list of connections. And so let's take a look at this example here. It has the same positions as this disordered graph that I drew here, but all of the hopping matrix elements are the same. So despite the fact that it looks weird, this is not equivalent to this disordered model. It's in fact exactly the same as this regular model over here. And so if you have this type of graph-like distortion where the only thing that matters is the connectivity, you can take something and deform it without changing anything. And this is really what, it, what the deformability of our resonators buys us. We can change the shape and decouple distance on the chip from 
distance in the tight binding model, which is given by hopping matrix elements. And for a square lattice like this, this is not a useful thing to do. This one was perfectly good to start with. But I will show you later on some lattices where a rendition like this that is perfectly regular is in fact impossible. And only a version like this can be made. And we can do this in circuits. You couldn't do this with atoms because they would end up giving you this form with a distance dependence hopping matrix element. And then finally, the last major difference between these and a conventional lattice is that our lattice site is a one-dimensional object. So if we zoom in on this device and look at it here and try to associate a lattice with this, um, a particular lattice with this device, your eye almost certainly picked out this graphene lattice that I've put on top here. But I have lied. I have done something bad. I've put an edge on every resonator and my lattice sites on the coupling capacitors. So this hexagonal lattice does not describe how photons move in this device. If I want to talk about how photons move, I need to draw this lattice here, which has a lattice site on every resonator and a hopping matrix element if the ends of those resonators touch. So I need a vertex on every resonator rather than an edge. And so that means that while our devices are going to naturally look sort of like graphene, we're going to call this our layout lattice, the effective lattice that describes photons in these systems is the medial lattice or the line graph, which is going to be Kagome-like. All right, so that's our toolbox. We have resonators and qubits, and our resonators are 1D and deformable, and so that allows us to make Kagome-like lattices and distort them in any way that we please. And so in the next part of my talk, I will show you how we, we use these properties to make photonic band structures that we couldn't already have. And in the first example, what we started to think about was, well, how do we use this deformability to make something, something interesting? And the first thing that occurred to us is that what this would allow us to do is to make curvature, something that was not flat. And so sort of inspired by ideas from general relativity that curvature is a natural thing, but that we can't get ready access to in the lab, we set out to make a hyperbolic lattice, so something that was tabletop in the lab, quantum mechanical, and curved. Now the problem with this is that we have to take our curved model and project it into flat 2D. And so if you have a flat lattice, like our favorite, graphene, you take some hexagons and you start tiling them and everything fits perfectly, you can continue this out to infinity. In a curved space, for example, in a spherical space, there's an equivalent tiling where instead of using hexagons, you can use pentagons. But if I start to draw this, even at a single vertex level, I already have a problem. Because these two corners, they should be the same lattice site, but they're not in the same place. And so in order to make them match again, you have to start stretching and extending everything. And there's no way to take this curved space model and smash it down into a flat 2D space and not ruin all of the distances. This is intrinsic. Um, hyperbolic or negatively curved case is the opposite. So instead of hexagons, we use heptagons. And now we have the opposite problem that instead of too much space, we have too little space. Things are overlapping instead of having a gap. And so you start having to compress each of your hexagons. And there's no way around this. And so if you tried to put this in to say a quantum gas microscope or a tweezer array and you place all of your atoms, there'd be no way to get around sort of ruining all of your hopping matrix elements. But in circuits, we can fix it. So this is how we would do it in circuits, sort of at the cartoon level. Right, so as I said, there's no way around the fact that the distances aren't preserved. But in these circuit models, the only notion of distance that we have is the hopping matrix elements. And so as long as we use the same coupling capacitors everywhere, the hopping matrix elements are fine. And so the only thing that's left to fix is the on-site energies. And we can do that by varying the shapes of the resonators. See, so if you look here on the inside where the distances are short, these resonators have a big meander. And out here on the edge where the distances are longer, they have a much smaller meander. And you're sort of doing the inverse here where you make this one perfectly straight and you put a big meander on there to make it all fit in. And so by exploiting this deformability, you can actually produce the original tight binding model even though there is no way to produce the original distances. Um, and so 
Spherical systems are actually available in the lab, for example, fullerenes and things like that. But hyperbolic case is actually fundamentally not embeddable in 3D. And so this is actually much harder to get hold of. And that's why we concentrated on, on this case here. And in particular, this heptagonal analog of graphene, which I will call heptagon graphene. And so we want to make this particular layout and then obtain its Kagome-like effective lattice. And so here we have the band structure for the conventional Euclidean Kagome lattice with hexagons. It has negative hopping for us, so the flat band is at the bottom, and then it has two bands above that. And so we would like to figure out the same kind of a plot for the hyperbolic version. Unfortunately, math is against us. Hyperbolic geometry is fundamentally non-commutative. Parallel lines and parallel translations, and orthogonal translations, they don't behave the way that we're used to. So that means that all of the conventional tricks of solid state physics go out the window. We can't define a Brave lattice anymore. We can't do Bloch theory. So we have to say goodbye to this beautiful plot. And the only thing that we have left are sort of more general graph theoretic techniques that actually exploit very little of the lattice symmetry and brute force diagonalization on finite size systems. These are the tools that we have left. And this is what one of these brute force <coughs> diagonalizations looks like for the Kagome lattice. It's essentially, it's a very silly plot really, it's just a list of the eigenvalues that came out of the numerical diagonalizer. And you can see the flat band very clearly and you have to work a lot harder to get information out of the rest of the spectrum and we've certainly lost all of the momentum information that was in here. Um, and so what we then did was we set out to do the same finite numerics for the, yes. So a flat band is just a massive degeneracy in this case. And so you see that there's a huge number of eigenvalues that are the same. Um, and so we can do the same thing for the hyperbolic lattice. And so we just make Sort of we start with a central polygon and add shells of neighbors and we go to larger and larger system sizes and do the same calculation. And it looks fairly similar. You see you have a flat band here at the bottom, some dispersive portion of the spectrum, but there's one big qualitative difference here is that there is now a macroscopic gap between the flat band and any other eigenstates. And this is very, very unusual among, um, among lattices and band structures. And it's also very, very exciting from a quantum simulation point of view because this is a huge degenerate manifold. And so that means that as soon as you add interactions, they can become the dominant energy scale and reorder things here extremely. So we were excited about this lattice, both from the fact that it was curved and from the fact that it had this gap flat band and we set out to make it in the lab. And this is what it looks like. So it's fabricated in niobium on sapphire on a one inch by one inch chip. Um, and what it is, is the central heptagon and two shells of neighbors. Um, it operates at about 16 gigahertz. And in addition to the lattice itself, it has four little antenna. These are input and output ports that allow us to do transmission measurements through here and really verify that we have the lattice that we intended to make. And it took quite a few iterations to beat down on various microwave engineering problems. But at the end of the day, this is what we obtained. So in blue here is the experimental transmission curve. And then on top of it in red, I have placed a series of theory curves for a few different disorder realizations. And the qualitative agreement is pretty good. We can see that we get the onset of peaks, you know, these variations in the line width, and also the you know, locations of many of the peaks. And so to within some small systematic on-site energy problems, sort of half a percent level on-site energy errors, these two are in agreement. The, the main complication actually in this particular data set is that there is leakage that goes around the device rather than through. And that's responsible for these very rolling background. You can see very clearly out here and also the fact that most of these line shapes are, are Fano rather than, than a straight up resonance. But for solid state, this is fairly good agreement.
and we have managed to produce the lattice that we wanted. And this was our proof of principle demonstration that we can actually make these hyperbolic lattices. Um, but as I said, we were interested in this particular device for two reasons. The fact that it was hyperbolic and the fact that it had this gapped flat band, which we wanted for quantum simulation. And so we also set out to figure out where that gap was coming from and whether we could make it much bigger and much more robust to any experimental imperfections. And we have figured out how, and really the key is actually the fact that I was talking about earlier, that we get the line graph effective lattice of this thing. And so what does it mean to have a line graph lattice? We've already seen a couple examples, so here's graphene. When we go to the line graph, we're gonna put a new lattice site on the middle of every bond. And so each of these hexagonal plecats rotates and then each of these vertices grows a triangle, right? So this is graphene and the kagome, heptagon and heptagon kagome. But mathematically, this is a perfectly general operation that I can apply to any graph, be it a tree or something with a higher coordination number like the square lattice here. In that case, the line graph is a little bit more unusual. So you see some square plaquettes that are conventional. And then you see these guys here. There's not actually a lattice site in the middle there. That's an optical illusion. What you have is this diagonal hopping matrix element because you get a coupling between everything that meets at that vertex. And so these are line graph lattices. And of these four, there are two of them here that are Euclidean. So we can easily calculate the band structures of both the original and the line graph. So here's graphene and the kagome we've seen before. And this is the square lattice with negative hopping. So this egg crate is, yes. No, I will hang on for a couple seconds <laughs> or a couple slides and I'll show you where it comes from. Right, and so you can see that now both of these cases have flat bands at minus two. And I have drawn this in an extremely suggestive color scale. And so you see there's flat bands at minus two and the remaining bands look completely identical to the band structure of the original graph that they came from. They're just shifted up a little bit in energy. And it turns out, if you find a mathematician and talk to him long enough and dig deep enough into the graph theory literature, this is not an accident. This is actually a completely general property of line graphs, this, this correspondence here. And so the way that you see this is we start to look at the, the Hamiltonian on the original layout graph. So we take an S-wave type binding model on the layout graph, and then we want to relate it to the effective model. Now, for these circuit devices, there's actually two effective models that you can get, depending on whether your on-site wave function is symmetric or anti-symmetric. Um, the symmetric case gives you an S-wave model on the line graph, and that's the only one that I will talk about today. The P-wave one is pretty cool, but there's lots of minus signs that make it very messy. And so we want to relate these two Hamiltonians. And to do that, we can borrow an operator from graph theory called the incidence operator, and it maps states on original graph to states on the line graph. And you can think of it just as a rectangular matrix that takes as an input vertices and outputs the edges to which that vertex is connected. And so you have this map and then the adjoint map which goes back the other direction. And if you do some linear algebra, you get these two relations. And so you find that M transpose M is very closely related to the layout Hamiltonian. The only difference is this matrix D here which is a diagonal matrix of the coordination numbers. And so if you start from something like graphene, where every lattice site has the same number of neighbors, this is a multiple of the identity. And when you do the multiplication the other way, you actually get the effective lattice. And these two operators have the same eigenvalues except for the kernel of this one because it's larger dimensional. And so abusing notation a little bit, we get a relation like this. And a little bit more exactly, what it says is that if you have an eigenvalue on the original lattice, there's a corresponding eigenenergy on the line graph, which is the coordination number minus two added to that. And so for graphene, this just shifts up by one. And then everything else in the line graph comes from the kernel of M transpose M and is the flat band at minus two. And this is a generally true statement, whether it's a Euclidean lattice, a hyperbolic lattice, a tree, whatever, as long as it's regular, can make this statement. And so that's in fact true across all of these cases. So we have layouts, effective line graph lattices, 
This is a sketch of the density of states for each of these cases. They're contained in minus the coordination number to the coordination number. And then when you go to the line graph, this just shifts over. And then the line graph appears at minus 2. And the other thing that you get from this is also that the flat band states are very closely related. They all come from the same mechanism. So this is the flat band state for graphene. Um, it's a non-zero on six sites. It's plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. And it's perfectly localized due to destructive interference in these triangular plaquettes. And you get the equivalent type thing here in the square lattice, except that the destructive interference is between one edge and the diagonal. But it's still penned in in the same way by these triangles with destructive interference. The tree is a little bit different because it doesn't have any closed loops. And so in fact, you get an exponentially localized flat band state. And then heptagon graphene is tricky because this loop has an odd number of sides. And so in fact, you have to make this, this larger loop here. But now we're starting to get a good picture. We understand what the states are in the flat band and where they're coming from. And we can also now see what we need to do in order to gap out that flat band, right? We need to start from a lattice like these two, where there are no states near minus the coordination number, because then when they shift up, that will leave a hole. And so these two have gapped flat bands, but these two don't. And so then the remaining question is, can we make a Euclidean lattice that also has a gapped flat band? And the answer is yes. So Graphene and the square lattice are what is called bipartite graphs. So that means that they can be divided into two sublattices, say yellow and red, such that for every site, all of the neighbors are in the opposite sublattice. And that means that we can just decree that the wave function is positive on all of the red sites and negative on all of the yellow sites. And that means that for every site in this lattice, it sees three, three opposite neighbors. And that guarantees for this kind of a bipartite graph that you're going to have states at minus the coordination number. And that's why graphene in the square lattice didn't work. But if you have a non-bipartite graph, simplest of which being just a ring with an odd number of sites, you cannot guarantee that all of the neighbors have opposite sign. And that's actually going to clear out the spectrum near minus the coordination number. And so that's what we need. We need non-bipartite graph with odd-sided loops. Um, the natural candidate would be the triangular lattice from the textbooks. The problem with that is that if you want to get the line graph of the triangular lattice, you need a completely symmetric six-way capacitive coupler, which you cannot make. And so instead, what we're going to do is we're going to use some tricks to make a highly non-bipartite lattice with a coordination number of three starting from graphene. So here we have graphene. And this is a cut through the spectrum. And it's these states down here that gave us the quadratic band touch that we want to get rid of. And so we're going to take a little bit of a step sideways. And what we're going to do is we're going to put a new lattice site on the middle of every bond. I call this subdivision. This is very, very much the same thing, how you get a Lieb lattice from a square lattice. Um, and you can also, you can actually work out the band structure of the subdivision lattice from the original one. You get a slightly different relation with the square root here. The so square root actually turns this flat band, or this quadratic band edge into a Dirac cone. You get a new, new flat band at zero. But the reason that we actually did this was because we wanted to take its line graph. And from that, we obtained this here. And this guy call it caffeine because it's partly like kagome and partly like graphene. <laughs> Spelled with a K and a PH, just. <laughs> um, this guy is special because like graphene that it started from, every site has three neighbors. So this is good. We can use this in hardware. And it also means that in principle, the spectrum runs from minus 3 to 3. But if we actually do the calculation, we find that there are no states below minus 2. This whole region down here has been cleared out. And so if we use this as our hardware layout, we obtain this effective lattice, which has a flat band minus, at minus 2 and a colossal gap of 1t up to the next states. And this is, in fact, 
the largest gap that you can get starting from any three regular graph. If we keep playing this game, you can also gap out this guy here, but I think in the interests of time, we will keep moving. Um, right. And so that was showing you how we can actually engineer these highly unusual band structures, so curvature and gap flat bands. And so now, in the final part of my talk, what I want to show you is sort of where, where we're going with this. And basically, what we need to do now is take our non-interacting photonic crystals and add interactions. We can either look for um, qubit-mediated photon-photon interactions or photon-mediated spin interactions. The latter is a little bit technically less challenging, and so that's where we've been going. Um, and so, cavity-mediated spin models. So if you take a qubit, and you, you take multiple qubits, and you put them in a cavity, then they can exchange interactions via the cavity mode. And if you have just a single cavity, then this is an infinite range, all-to-all -all interaction, which is perfectly mean field and relatively boring. And so if you want to make something a little bit more creative, you need to have more photonic modes in play. Um, the natural first candidate was a 1D photonic crystal in a qubit. And so now you have the same swap interaction, or flip-flop, in all modes in parallel. And so you get an effective interaction in this form, where each mode has a different wave function and a different detuning. And so the detunings are going to change the weighting of the modes, and the different wave functions and the different wavelengths are going to give you some interference. And so when you integrate over the quadratic band edge of a photonic crystal, you actually get an exponentially localized interaction. Um, and the single qubit self-energy of this was measured in the Hout group in 2016. So this is a transmission plot here. So this is the band where transmission is high, and this is the gap where transmission is low. And so then what's happening here is that a qubit is tuning in this parabolic arc. And but your transmission peaks that you see are shifted away from the qubit. And so this, this here is the self-energy of this exponentially localized interaction of the qubit with itself. Um, in 2018, 2019, they also measured the two-qubit interactions. So this is a slightly different technique where you can actually measure the, the resonances themselves. And this is an avoided crossing between one qubit that's here and another qubit that's going through. And so it's been demonstrated that you really can get these sort of exponentially localized interactions, but we want to build up to something a little bit more complicated, a little bit more versatile than this 1D exponential. And there's two ways to do it. So one, which I will be actively working on in my lab, is to put qubits in the unconventional band structures that I was showing in the earlier part of my talk. In fact, the flat bands give you a short-range frustrated magnetic interaction. And then the other way that you can make this a little bit more interesting is to go to a more complicated and more versatile coupling scheme. Um, and so that is being worked on now in collaboration with the Hout group. And the key to this is to go to Raman-coupled spin models. And so now we take a three-level system, two ground states and an excited state, and in this case, you want to drive a flip-flop by exchanging two photons, one classical drive photon and one cavity photon. And so you now have microwave control over everything. You have two relevant detunings, one from the intermediate state and one from the final state. And you get a very similar effective swap interaction. I've left off the mode sum just because it's getting a little confusing. And so you can control the amplitude with the drive rate, and you have these two detunings here. And so if you do this in a 1D photonic crystal with a single drive, you basically get the same exponentially localized interaction you had before. OK, not really a win. But this is a microwave drive. And so you can now put on multiple drive tones at the same time without a lot of difficulty. And that gives you a superposition of exponentials. And so you can use that to then build up, for example, an approximate power law interaction. And so this is the direction that we are going. The technical challenge here is that you need a three-level qubit for this. And the transmon, which is our, our favorite and most common dude, 
has a ladder-like spectrum that is very much not suitable for this. And so we have to use instead fluxonium, which was actually Vlad's thesis when he was a grad student in the Deveret group and that he's continued doing a lot of amazing work on. And so this is this the circuit diagram for fluxonium. It's a capacitor, a Joseph's injection, and an inductor. And so the Hamiltonian for this looks like so. You have a kinetic energy term from the capacitor. You have a quadratic potential from the inductor and the same cosine term from the Joseph's injunction. And now you have sort of one extra ingredient, which is that you have closed loop here that you can thread flux through. And what that does is it shifts the cosine around. And so this is sort of a cartoon of this potential. You have this big quadratic potential, and then you have wiggles on top of it. And so this now supports two types of transitions. One, intrawell transitions. These are called plasmons. And interwell transitions called fluxons when you tunnel in between these. And now you can have a lambda system of this form. And fluxonium is a new qubit. Two qubit gates for it are state of the art. So we decided to actually concentrate on just arranging this coupling first in a single mode cavity before working our way up to a full photonic crystal. Um, and so we, have, we had a couple initial devices in the fridge in May and June. And this is two-tone spectroscopy of the device. Basically what's being done here is you monitor have one monitor tone at the cavity, and you attempt to drive qubit transitions. And if you succeed, then you decrease the cavity transmission. So that's these dark lines here. This one is just the cavity. It's a bit fake. But you see the plasmon transitions and the fluxon transitions. And in here, in these devil's horns, is hiding a Raman tran cavity-assisted Raman transition from one ground state to the other. Um, and so what we started out to do is to drive Rabi oscillations on this Raman transition. And so we put a Gaussian pulse on the drive tone and rely purely on the cavity coupling to take it the rest of the way over. So there's, there aren't two classical drives in this Raman transition. There's only one. So we apply our Raman pulse, and then we measure the state of the qubit. And we were able then to observe Rabi oscillations with increasing power. And so when we are on resonance, if we drive hard enough, we can drive a flop, and it goes back and flop and back. And so we've demonstrated that we really can have this sort of one drive only Raman transition where the cavity takes it the rest of the way over. Um, and so what we're in the process of doing now is redesigning this device to get better parameters so that we can now go off resonance. And instead of simply driving Rabi flop, put a finite detuning here and get our two qubit flip-flop. Um, and so to conclude, I've hopefully convinced you that circuit QED lattices are a fun platform for artificial condensed matter systems, that we can make artificial photonic materials with interacting photons or photon-mediated spin models, and that we have unique capabilities for engineering the photonic spectrum, either to make curved lattices or flat bands, and that we can use microwave control and more advanced qubits to also have a handle on the interactions. And so going forward in my lab, we're going to be moving in all of these directions, looking for interacting photons, and tuning of interactions. This one in particular, these two in particular, the power law profiles and interactions in collaboration with Hauk Group, and then focusing on the many body physics and flat bands and spin models. And then just to finish up, I need to thank all of my partners who made this possible. So my postdoc advisor, Andrew Hauk, Peter Sarnak, our math collaborator, who knows many, many, many things if we can just learn how to speak enough math to communicate. <laughs> Alexei Gorshkov, who did a lot of work, particularly on the uh, interactions in photonic crystal stuff and has been instrumental in supporting further development of the hyperbolic lattice projects, particularly Igor and Shemek over there. And then three grad students in Hauk Lab who made this experimental data possible. Matthias made the hyperbolic lattice and Jake working on the, uh, the fluxonium devices.